I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Christoph Lambert. Before I read off the program a little, a little bit to give you a feel of his background, I just want to say how we met and um, why he's so important to Nami, Montana. Uh, when, when we first envisioned bringing research to Montana that we could help guide from NAMI Montana's lens and not just the researchers, so we could be a partner in doing the things that we thought were, were important to care for our people and our families. Um, a, a lot of people didn't think that that was possible. They just didn't think that the researchers would listen to us. And fortunately, we didn't listen to that. Uh, for, for better or worse, our ears don't always work that well. Uh, so, so we just kind of plowed ahead, but we worked to start this research center at Montana State, and one researcher stepped forward right away and said, I want to partner with you. I have a plan. I, have, I, I didn't know exactly what we're going to do, and let's get this going and go after it. And that was Dr. Christoph Lambert. He absolutely was all in on partnering with people who live with mental illness and their families before there was a check in the mail. It was his vision that he could make it work. Um, so, and the musical accompaniment. Uh, <laughs> and I would not point it out except for I love teasing Judy. So she would do the exact same thing to me, so don't feel sorry for her. Uh, anyway. Uh, Dr. Christoph Lambert is an associate professor of medicine at the University of New Mexico, uh, pre previously at Montana State, with appointments at the Center for Global Health and Division of Translational Informatics within the Department of International Medicine. He is the founder, past CEO, and current, and current chairman of Golden Helix, a Bozeman-based bioinformatics company whose software has been cited in over a thousand peer-reviewed Genom genomics research publications over the past 10 years. And, and there's more that goes into it, but most importantly to us, he did bring research to Montana, and he did partner with NAMI Montana and, and the people that we work with. He did make it possible. So a young, like, young Emma Bolesky can talk with the head, or the former head of drug development for GlaxoSmithKline about bipolar disorder and about how it works and how it doesn't. And he'll talk about all the other things, but I've seen those interactions and I've seen world-class researchers talk to Montanans with bipolar di disorder. And it's real and it happened exactly like Christoph said it would. So I'm pretty really incredibly proud to introduce a friend and colleague, Dr. Dr. Christoph Lambert. Really have to give so much credit to Matt. Really have to give so much credit to Matt because he reached out to me when I was a professor at Montana State University, and he mentioned a PCORI opportunity where we could go out for funding at the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And the, uh, the whole idea of is to partner with patients. I'm going to use the word patients. I apologize if some people like consumer or whatever, but um, it, it's, all, it's all good. And we partnered and back in 2014, and we tried round after round, six rounds of trying to apply for money to do this research, and, and we partnered with, with folks from NAMI Montana and then NAMI uh, New Mexico, and I moved down to Albuquerque as well as NAMI Los Angeles. And, and we finally you know, won some funding, $2.4 million to do research on outcomes of interest to patients, people who have bipolar disorder. So I have no financial disclosures, at least any personal ones. Uh, some other folks as part of our team do, but they're not talking today. And so this is the grant, or the, it's actually a contract with Corey that funds our research. 
I'm going to talk a bit about <clears throat> what it means to have a patient-driven bipolar disorder study with PCORI and how, how it's gone for us thus far. The NAMI focus groups that we conducted, last year we conducted one in Helena at the tail end of the, of the uh, Montana Mental Illness Conference, where we elicited from patients what their priorities are. And we did that with two other focus groups in New Mexico and Los Angeles. And I'll talk about really the analysis that we did. And we discovered as we were listening to, to many perspectives that it wasn't just about the drugs, it wasn't just about, <clears throat> about challenging with insurance companies or reimbursement or how one interacts with one's family. There's just this whole complex system picture of what it takes to get stability and recovery for people with bipolar disorder. And um, we wanted to really find some of the core causes behind the challenges that everyone faces and, and see is there some essential unity to the experience. And we think we've, we've discovered, discovered that. And we'll talk about essentially a system level diagnostic. And there'll be a lot of detail to it and I'll try to walk through it and, and, and make it as clear as I can. Um, and, and talk about then, once we've diagnosed the problem with the system, what can we do to improve it? So the study, is, as I mentioned, is funded by PCORI, and patients have to be engaged uh, in the design of the research. So when we wrote our proposal, we had a shared Google Doc, and we were all writing it together, this proposal. Alicia participated, and well, I'll name everybody in a moment, but um, we uh, set out, at first we were trying to build a, a computer system for individually predicting patient outcomes. <clears throat> but Corey didn't go for that funding, but eventually did go for us comparing a bunch of treatments, including non-treatment, uh, for various bipolar disorder outcomes. And some of the ones that we worked with our patient partners to identify our hospitalizations, suicidality and self-harm, uh, kidney disorders, obesity, which is part of metabolic syndrome, all-cause mortality. And then through the, uh, the three years of the study, they were also to go out and do focus groups and identify additional outcomes from a larger pool of engaged patients and patient partners, family members of patients, um, and other stakeholders so that we can go to a large database of patient records using this big data analysis and, and find uh, answers to those questions, you know, what's the right treatment for me given my individual characteristics? And this is the team, it's probably hard to see, but up at the top here, which is very notable, is a patient partner advisory council. And you see our own Matt Kuntz, with Ron Crawl, who, as, as Matt mentioned, is, is a former chief medical officer of GlaxoSmithKline, retired and now has a real passion to work with us on this. And we have Kimmy Jordan from NAMI, Montana. Many of you might know Emma Valeski, Alicia Smith, Quentin Schroeder. So both Alicia and Quentin are here. Some of you know Jason DeShaw, country music singer. And, and we have a, a, another partner, Alan Hess, from NAMI, Westside Los Angeles. We have teams involved in the data analysis, team, team or setting up all the data analysis, actually running specific studies to answer different questions. Anastasia spoke yesterday about one of our studies on hospitalization in the parallel sessions, and she's uh, working on several others. There's a statistical team. We have our chair of psychiatry um, and uh, uh, statisticians uh, who are fellows of the American Statistical Association. Uh, uh, psychiatrists, neuroscientists, terminologists, uh, uh, and uh, partners from NAMI who help us with our focus groups and, and re reviewing our design and so forth. So we meet regularly. Um, we promise quarterly what, would be, what we've met, met often monthly and sometimes more than that is, as key events have, have been coming up. and. Um, I must say, it's, it's, uh, it just changes the way you do research when you're presenting what you do and asking, you know, what do you think of this? And we went even further, though, with, with this study, and I'll get to it for, 
So it's not just advisory, it's participatory. So the, so the general schema of the research we're doing is our first major effort, or aim one, is to identify outcomes of interest to patients. And that's what I'll be talking about, the results of a set of three focus groups where we're eliciting feedback. And then there's always communication between, between us and patients and patient stakeholders. And then based on identifying those outcomes, we're going to compare different treatments, often their medications, and then identifying different outcomes. Because um, when we say, is, what's the best drug for me? It's not the same for everyone. Maybe one person cares about weight gain, another person cares about uh, side effects with their kidney, another person cares about how clear their mind is, or how high level their energies are. And so there could be many different outcomes. Um, and then we want to look not just there's uh, an individual, um, sorry, we want to look at individual patient characteristics to, to recognize that, you know, males and females may not respond the same. People with, with different uh, comorbid conditions, uh, which is just a fancy word for just saying other diseases that come along with bipolar disorder, um, there, there may be a different treatment indicated. A lot of clinical trials that are run will, will have kind of a, uh, the healthiest of the people who have a given disease. So they'll tend not to be very old, they won't be children. And then we ask, you know, you know, I'm 70 years old and maybe my kidneys are, are not what they used to be or here's my child. And we don't have answers for those questions of what's the best treatment. And so we're setting out to fill in that body of evidence knowing that clinical trials will never be run. They tend to be the gold standard of evidence. But instead we're looking at a large database of over 1.3 million people with bipolar disorder in the United States um, uh, and uh, using it to compare treatments and outcomes. So this general cartoon is I want to compare treatment A, which also could be no treatment, to treatment B for patients like me for outcome C, D, and E. And so you, you can envision here's your brain coming, coming for uh, for uh, consultation, what, I may have had something, uh, uh, something come up in my life. Uh, there's presenting symptoms, there's a challenge of diagnosis, and a physician will gu guide you and say, well, we could go this way or that way, and here's the expected outcomes. Well, how do we get at that? With, well, with 1.3 million people, um, there's often many people who are not, we're all, in, in, entirely unique, but there are many people who would be similar to us in terms of demographics, medications, other diseases we have, um, perhaps drug metabolism, substance use, for instance. Th those are things we could find in their records if they've been recorded. So there's this history of your life before you come to make a decision. I go either A or B or maybe C, but for simplicity we can go between two choices and ask what are all the outcomes and and it's probabilistic, we can't say with certainty, but it can be better evidence than just trial and error. Um, uh, that, that is what we've heard from our patient partners is, is all too common. So there, the NAMI focus groups that we conducted were three of them, in, one in Montana, one in Albuquerque, one in Los Angeles, or three hours with 11 to 12 persons with bipolar disorder or having a close family member with bipolar disorder. And the overarching theme was, what do you wish you had known in advance over the course of treatment for bipolar disorder? So if you knew then what you knew now, maybe you would have made different choices. <laughs> and we had our participants generate, in each focus group, over 100 questions. You know, like, does lithium cause, cause uh, kidney failure? Or, you know, I'm 70 years old and what's the best treatment for me given I also have anxiety, things like that. Um, and we had our participants categorize them and prioritize their 100 plus questions that they generated individually and then as a group. And I'll go through that process. And after these focus groups were completed, we looked at all of this information, tried to further uh, crunch the three different focus groups into a, a, a harmony of categories and have both patient partners and researchers rank the questions that were generated. 
And then we looked at the core causes behind this big picture we were seeing about all the challenges that were faced. So we did a, a what's called an affinity mapping exercise. We had uh, our participants take about 15 minutes. They could individually write down their <coughs> one question per sticky note. And they, we have you know 100 plus sticky notes on a wall. And then everyone's standing up, clustering them, moving them back and forth into different categories. Amazingly, that process actually converges. Some people uh, uh, you know, who are very detail-oriented end up finishing off, or others get tired, and okay, I've had enough of that. And, um, and then once we, we labeled the categories collectively, uh, each person was given a 3, 2, and a 1 score, 3 being the most important. They could stick it by a category, and we could sum up the, 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 the scores and discuss the results. So you're not meant to read this, but to just get a, a, a picture of this was the NAMI Montana um, set of sticky notes, and you see, you know, there was diagnosis, screening, behaviors, symptoms, uh, big ideas was kind of a parking lot for all sorts of miscellaneous ones, um, support, children. Um, um, here was one from NAMI, New Mexico. Here was social bias and stigma, family dynamics support, uh, education, crisis management, healthcare system navigation, sy symptom management, provider relations, diagnosis and research, education, support resources, alternatives and adjuncts to medication. That was a big category, by the way. And then we did this again in Los Angeles. And so we took, and we had something like 33 labels that came out of, out of these groups. And we, we looked at what the content was, and we found there was really 10 categories across the three focus groups. And when we added up the scores from that collapsing of them, here was the number one, alternatives and adjuncts to ph ph pharmacotherapy. And we're going to get into why that is the, was the number one uh, issue that came up. But you know, how many people are saying, you know, my, my, my medications aren't 100%. What else can I do, either in addition to or instead of medications? And there's so many questions about: Is, is this effective? Is that effective? Um, you know, how can I get off my meds, and so forth? If you think about if we were if we were taking our meds and we felt great and we were 100% good, like you know, an antibiotic just takes care of a of an infection and we're done. We probably wouldn't have so many. Uh, um, uh, people looking for alternatives, right? So the state of psychiatry and our ability to treat bipolar disorder is obviously less than, less than uh, complete or, or ideal. The second one, which is closely related, was pharmacotherapy. And so it's no surprise that medication is an important part of, of regulating mood and keeping uh, people with bipolar disorder stable and uh, and there's the top, and then here we see we had the top question ranked by a set of researchers as well as our patient partners. And we saw, interestingly, when we independently ranked them, that most of these came up very similar. Often we hear about a disconnect between researchers and, and, and patients and what they care about. So um, researchers, uh, and, and many of the, the ones, this was just the top one, but if you go down the list, you see that, that the rankings were pretty similar. <coughs> Provider relations was a big one. So the relations with your, with your doctor, with your, your caregiving institutions. Um, understanding bipolar disorder. So a lot of questions, you know, what's it, what's it caused by? And, and, and you know, just understanding the disease itself. Support systems, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, the, both the family as well as the other 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 ways of finding support, healthcare system navigation, diagnosis. There's a lot of issues with with people uh, not being diagnosed correctly, and, and as as was shown in our hospitalization study that was presented yesterday, we saw some we saw something like. Um, over 40% of patients are first diagnosed with major depressive disorder and later bipolar is discovered. And so people are being treated for depression when un the underlying cause and mechanism 
is, is, uh, is bipolar. So, uh, as we go down the list, the top 10, coping and management, social bias and stigma, and then there was kind of a miscellaneous category that a lot of these things were, uh, and then included both like children, but it was pretty much all the same other categories asked with respect to children, you know, support for my children, uh, medication <coughs> questions for children, and so forth. So it, there have been other efforts to prioritize patient concerns with respect to, to bipolar disorder, in fact, some, some much larger than this, who've done a similar process, and we found that there was concordance with what we found in these other studies. But what hasn't been done is to really say, well, what was the root cause behind, uh, behind the challenges that were faced? And so the next step was to go discover systemic core conflicts. And, what, and I'll show you what I mean by a core conflict. The basic idea being, if there's a root cause behind why things are bad, why are we not just doing the opposite or taking away that core cause? Well, there's, there's often some other need or something that prevents us doing that other thing. And so there's a push-pull, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll discover that uh, within our data. So what we did is we took the 300 and something questions patients had, and we distilled it further and said, what was the negative, the undesirable effect that was really behind the question or the statement? For instance, you know, this is, so these were done by the researchers, and we found, uh, and with the patients, we went over, remember going through that whole list, Alicia? Yeah. Um, and you don't need to, I don't necessarily need to read all of these, but, but, but what you see here is, is a broad set of concerns that go all over the place. You say, how could there be, there must be many, many, many causes to all these negative effects, right? And, um, and there's a certain school of system thinking called theory of constraints that I spent many years as, a, as when I was running my business trying to better understand how to run my own organizations, where the basic idea is even though the complexity in terms of details of the problems we face can be very broad, we'll see lots of <coughs> negatives, because life is interconnected, you find there often is very few leverage points for change that have the most power. So rather than being overwhelmed with the detail complexity, and here's the next slide of even more of these, um, uh, can we find the few points that really explain all the negatives that are going on? So you see, you know, the experience of stigma, isolation, loss of relationships, discrimination, lack of education, lack of knowledge from providers. Um, Caregivers of bipolar patients feeling powerless to compel care until harm to self or others has already happened. Um, there's actually some of these that won't be covered by this analysis. That's one of them. Um, we think we have some ideas for, for, for yet another root cause to do with individual liberty versus public safety, but that's for another day. Um, Treatments, outcomes are uncertain, risky for patients. They're not getting proper care. Trial and error is all too common. There's suicidality is a big, is a big factor. Um, people uh, don't get a holistic or thorough assessment. They're getting a 15-minute visit with a, with a psychiatrist and, and left to their own devices. I mean, it's, 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 it's a real challenge that, that, that we're hearing embedded in all of the statements from patients. And so then, as a group, we got on a webinar. We were various places in the country, and any one of our researchers in Europe. And we took these 40-some uh, undesirable effects, and we started connecting <coughs> from cause to effect. And the idea is you, you say, well, what's the similarity? Be, you know, does this cause this? Is there another cause that causes them both? And so you add additional, and you're not meant to read this, this is kind of a, just a big schema, and you try to converge down from this bushy tree into one or a few causes. And then after that, it's kind of overwhelming all that detail to use 47 different things. 
you, you try to simplify, and I'll show you the simplified presentation that we did after that. But before I do, I'd like to go through a change metaphor with you that, that also informed how we thought about, about um, uh, the choices that, that patients face given the challenges with treatment, particularly uh, pharmacotherapy. So suppose I say, you know, Matt, I want you to climb this mountain. You're like, go fly a kite. It's cold up there. I'll break my leg. Um, um, I'm not going to do it, right? So I might break my leg. And I say, oh, Matt, but there's a pot of gold on top of that mountain. You can go up and get it, and you'll be, you'll be rich. You'll be able to help Nami. And uh, <laughs> he says, well, I don't know. And I said, but Nat, there's also this big alligator that if you don't leave now, it's going to bite your leg, right? He's like, okay, well, I don't know, but you know, there's this lovely mermaid down here at the bottom of the mountain, and, and, and she, won't, uh, she won't go up there with me. And so what we find is, in order to change, we, we must have a good enough reason of a benefit for going from here to there, right, the pot of gold. But if it's too treacherous and risky, you know, if I just say, I'm going to give you a million dollars, no strings attached, you're like, no problem, I'll make that change, right? But if you're like, well, what's the hidden strings, you know, is there something? Well, you know, you're going to have to work for me for the next fight. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> um, and then um, the alligators, of course, you know, generally bad things need to, need to push us from where we are to make a change because there's a comfortability of the known. And also that comfortability of the known, our security and identity is represented in that mermaid. It's a bit of a mythical creature. And, um, and it's the good things about the status quo, about the here and now, that we feel we're going to lose if, if we make the change. And so, as we'll see uh, later in, in our system diagram, the, there's a key conflict between let's... I don't want to be treated because of, because of, um, well, first of all is I have bipolar disorder and there's bad things happening to me. That's the alligator of the here and now, right? So the negatives of untreated bipolar disorder. And there's a choice of do I remain unmedicated or do I undergo generally pharmacotherapies indicated for bipolar disorder. And, uh, we, ne we know those negatives pretty well. High risk of suicide, depression and mania, psychosis, anxiety, problems with sleep, cognitive decline can happen, substance misuse, destruction of relationships, loss of employment. There's a lot of alligators here, right? Mm -hmm. Stigma, risk of criminality, promiscuity-driven STDs and unwanted pregnancies, trauma due to risky behavior can happen, distress of family, peers, and co-workers. So there's a lot of alligators here that bring us to wanting to get help. The help that's offered is, here's pharmacotherapy. You know, like, well, yeah, I generally trust my doctors, and, and they're saying that I could have a stable mental state. I could have stable relationships, stable employment. But then what happens often is this pharmacotherapy uh, experience has broken legs associated with that change. We have, can have loss of motivation, particularly on some of the antipsychotics that that uh, hit, uh, that reduce dopamine. There can be this idea of uh, once I have that label and I'm treated, um, it, 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 it doesn't jive with my identity. I think of myself as well, as whole, and, and to, to say, well, now this label's been put on me and uh, that doesn't feel so good. S uh, high expenses for some, adverse <coughs> drug events, side effects, drug-induced comorbidities, so other conditions that come up, like obesity or or diabetes, impaired sense of identity, cognitive dissonance with regard to artificial versus natural recovery. Well, you know, this idea that, that um, um, I could be, uh, that, um, that if somehow it's this substance that seems kind of foreign and, 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 and alien, I'm not whole or well, unless I'm off of them. I, I know how to describe it, but it's, it's something that we've been trying to wrap our arms around, where 
this idea that that if medication's a part of keeping me well, somehow I'm not fully well. Um, and finally, that mermaid or merman. We thought, let's let's uh, let's uh, for, for the half in the room who who. Uh, so, by the way, <clears throat> anyone recognize this mermaid? We're in uh, Great Falls, Montana. Oh. Sip and Dip is a is a local bar that that they have mermaids that you can watch them swim in a tank, and uh, and. Uh, and so bipolar is not all bad. There's, there's high productivity, high self-esteem, perhaps too high when things are, are elevated with hypomania. With, with uh, that hypomania, you can have high energy levels, a lifestyle with pleasurable activities. And for many, being medicated means I no longer have that, those mermaids or mermen, if you will, of, of the positives of untreated bipolar disorder, that, that some of those, those highs and so forth are associated with uh, uh, risks of going into, into mania and being hospitalized and having all sorts of bad things happen, but especially if someone was hypomanic for many years and they were used to functioning at that high level of energy and sharpness and, and speed and, and being extremely confident, uh, you know, it can be like being on a cocaine high and feel wonderful. Uh, I had a, I took a medication once that induced, was a steroid that induced a hypomanic state, and I was like, wow, I don't have any self-doubt, I can do anything, I'm going to take over the world, and, and it was like, this is, this is amazing, this, 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 this is the real me, why, I've been, I felt so, uh, you know, so, you can understand how giving that up is can be a real factor in in you know when someone says I was on these meds and they they made me feel flat. Well, maybe the rest the rest of us kind of feel about that way. But if you felt this way for many years, it's 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 a real mermaid or merman to give up. And so, <coughs> treating the disease ends up narrowing the band of of that emotional. Uh, expression and so forth. So taking all this together, we're saying, well, <clears throat> we'd like you to, we think it's, it's, we want a stable mental state, we want stable relationships, stable employment, but all these negatives could go with the treatment themselves. And for many, we find that the, the alligators don't even go away because they didn't get the right drug for you and so forth. And then we lose our mermaids. So as we'll show in our system diagram, for many, their experience of being on bipolar meds and doing what their doctor says is that they not, o not only don't get rid of the alligator, they don't get the pot of gold, they, get, they break their legs going up the mountain, and they lose their mermaids. Is it any one wonder that people want to, to find alternatives because also, you know, the, the alligator's not acceptable, so we try to find other, other ways. And that's really what we see. Um, and so in order to move forward, many people to finally get on therapy, we heard stories of people for 10 years or something, they had to really experience the alligator. Their lives had to, had to spiral into a really bad place. And, and then there was, okay, I'm going to give up my my mermaid finally and be treated and I'm stable and, and that's life's good. But this, this expectation of this journey, when you open your brochures for bipolar disorder, you don't hear that, right? You know, here's the drugs for bipolar, here's what bipolar's like. No, this journey of, of, of all those, facing all those negatives is what we heard from our participants. So we need to, inc to make the change towards, towards pharmacotherapy, if, or whatever therapy, could be alternatives if they actually were to deliver the benefits. We need to increase the size of the pot of gold. We need to reduce the risk of breaking your leg going to get that benefit, climbing up the mountain. Um, generally what change you have to show, you know, this alligator is really big, you might, ah, it's okay, you know, I don't know the, need those people anyhow. Those are your family members, they're your support structure that's gonna, that's gonna hold things together. And figure out how to you know, is there some way we can hold on to some of what's good about bipolar? Or 
find ways to have new mermaids, perhaps. Um, can we take our mermaid up the mountain with us? Maybe in an aquarium. So we're going to analyze our focus group data in light of this model. So we start with, and I'll read these out. I hope you can, can see them. Um, pretty universal. People want to feel good, right? But many bipolar, BD, bipolar disorder patients, become increasingly unwell. And so they seek to gain the positives of pharmacotherapy and avoid the negatives of bipolar. So I want to go to that promised pot of gold of being well and get rid of those alligators, right? And so many patients seek pharmacotherapy. Now, for various reasons we'll, that most who have bipolar are familiar with, many patients increasingly believe pharmacotherapy will be detrimental. And so then they seek to retain the positives of bipolar disorder and avoid the negatives of pharmacotherapy. So I'm going to hold on to that mermaid and not have all those negatives of side effects and so forth. And so many patients avoid pharmacotherapy. That core conflict of both the choice of seeking pharmacotherapy versus avoiding pharmacotherapy is a key dynamic that we see outpictured uh, in, in our focus group data. Now, if you look at if the pharmacotherapy just worked and we were well and whole and, and so forth, we wouldn't have such issues. But the, th this red box, mental health care, does not address many patients' needs. We're going to expand this whole box into why the mental health care system is less than ideal, but including the drugs, including the support structures, and so forth. When we seek that pharmacotherapy, <coughs> Many patients experience the negatives, and they lose the positives of bipolar disorder, as, and I went over all those before, right? And so having the negative experience, it reinforces that pharmacotherapy is no good for me. And so then they go down this path, okay, I'm going to avoid pharmacotherapy. But they still have those negatives of bipolar. It may be stable for a while. Oh, I can, you know, I can deal with it. But then something happens, a stressor, a life event, or, and they can lose the positives of pharmacotherapy of having their disease well managed, stable life, relationships, job, and so forth. So without pharmacotherapy, we still have that alligator, and we're not having the benefits of being, having our disease well managed. So Further, being on treatment, we can actually still have our alligators and not get our pot of gold. So there's any wonder with the treatment side, we can have all four things not being well for us. And so then we say, well, uh, you know, pharmacotherapy is not good for me. And they become increasingly unwell, being untreated or having a treatment that's not working for them. And so being in this conflict, too, tends to oscillate. Treatment, non-treatment. Oh, I feel stable now. I'm going to get off those drugs. And so this oscillation between adherence and non-adherence to their pharmacotherapy, these many patients have become pharmacotherapy resistant. Because with bipolar disorder, it's a, what's called a kindling model, where the memory pattern of cycling starts to ingrain itself with repetition. And as you have stressors in life that trigger these things, the activation barrier can lower with time as the memory pattern is created, which is, by the way, one of the reasons um, that, that electroconvulsive therapy can be effective is it sort of resets those memory patterns. So um, <clears throat> naturally then, you're saying, well, between this rock and this hard place, there must be another way. So many patients seek alternative treatments, which was our number one uh, uh, thing that came up. But many alternative treatments are not sufficient to alleviate the symptoms of BD. And what we heard from a lot of patients was, was support and adjunct to pharmacotherapy. Sometimes they got their doses down and then had various ways. And then there's a, lot of, a whole lot of coping skills that, that are tremendously effective but also a whole lot of questions about different substances and herbs and so forth. Do they work? Do they benefit? We don't have answers to those things. And so many people experience that their, their attempts at doing something uh, 
alternative don't lead them to full uh, addressing of those alligators and they're not getting full stability uh, and, and, and the good things that come with, with having their, their, their disease well treated. So that central conflict we see out pictured is really exacerbated by this whole box, which is mental health care doesn't address many patients' needs. And this gets to the, the system, the health care system, and we'll go into that next. So that bubble, mental health care doesn't address many patients' needs. There's three main categories that we identified of, it, of why and how it doesn't identify patients' needs. But in it not meeting the needs, this is where, you know, getting the negatives of, of pharmacotherapy, not getting the positives, uh, like losing the mermaid, retaining the negatives of bipolar, the, that alligator stays, and losing the positives of pharmacotherapy. So we see many patients experience disadvantages of minimized contact with their provider. So this is just how much time and attention do I get from my provider? Many patients experience challenges related to the current state of psychiatry. The drugs aren't effective. Many patients have limited access to mental health care services. So under the, the minimized contact, they're not informed about all available resources. There's not sufficient psychoeducation. There's uh, time-consuming individualized treatment strategies are not implemented. When you just have a 15-minute prescription visit, you're not getting that. Improper diagnostic and treatment decisions are made. There's a lack of psychological support from providers. And referrals to other providers and services are limited. Re rehabilitation services are limited. Under the uh, challenges related to, to the current state of psychiatry, we see BD diagnosis lacks a robust objective biological basis. We don't have a nice biomarker-based test that we can say, you know, as well as to track how well you're doing on treatment. Scientific evidence on bipolar is, is insufficient and consistent. Trial and error is commonplace. Provider competence is variable. Some people have amazing psychiatrists, others have horrible experiences. <laughs> bipolar disorder patients, somatic health issues are often not addressed. So there's an interaction with all the internal medicine uh, with, with the psychiatric medicine. And the patient perceived positives of bipolar disorder are unaddressed by psychoeducation. That mermaid is often not talked about, but it's one of the big, really big factors. On the access side, there's long waiting lists in many cases. There's expensive services, too expensive for many. Poor rural access that we experience in Montana as well as in New Mexico where I live. Low, low access for economically disadvantaged patients. And a payer system that constrains the physician and patient care choices. So, you know, what's behind all this stuff, right? Well, uh, on the side of, of the minimized contact with their provider, we find you know, there's a decision to make provider visits short. In fact, the, the payment system incentivizes 15-minute visits, not hour-long visits, right? And follow-up tends to be minimized. Why? The providers are focusing on quantity of mental health care delivery. Why is that? Well, the mental health care system is trying to meet as much people's needs as possible. And, and on the other hand, and so... But we live in a world of limited resources, and the financial resources are in short supply. There's been less and less allocation of funds to mental health relative to the need. And why? There are many competing requests for public funds, including retirement and medical care for an aging baby boomer population, and also incarceration is one of the big budget items. So there's a competing uh, resource issue. So, on the other hand, you know, there's, providers want to do the best for patients. They want to focus on quality, and if they're focused on quality, you'd have long visits and have extensive follow-up. Why don't we do that? Well, we have the limited resources, and so there's some people who get very good care, but then there's poor access for those who don't, can't afford it or don't have availability. So we see this core conflict in the system with limited resources, quantity, and quality. And because of all these 
reasons we're not meeting patients' needs and we're seeing all those, those negative effects. Patients are increasingly unwell. The healthcare system is further overloaded by the demand of people who aren't cared for properly. That reinforces that, that there's a scarcity of supply relative to demand. And you got the whole picture, kind of a negative feedback loop. So I'm running tight on time, so I'm, I'm um, going to try to go through, you know, what can we do about, about the system? Well, we want to intervene at, at the core causes and um, get to the place, in the case of this system level one, that most patients' mental health care needs are addressed. So we want them to have the advantages of proper mental health care, um, uh, the benefits from improvements in psychiatry, and have excellent access. Now, the causes of why there's not enough, not proper psychiatrists really, you know, science just hasn't advanced uh, in many cases, but also there's good things that have been devised that haven't been universally implemented. For instance, the suicide uh, uh, prevention strategy that's just been piloted in Montana is one of those things. So, when we look at, um, we want to have objective measures. So uh, lab tests should be developed specific for mental disorders. Physician residency programs should emphasize interdisciplinary treatment, so you're treating the whole person. Comprehensive evidence should be generated about, about bipolar pathophysiology and treatment. That's what we're doing with our large studies of asking and answering these questions, comparing different treatments. Unified guidelines and algorithms for BD care should be universally adopted that account for both in, for individual differences in patients. We should have collaborative multidisciplinary team-based approaches to provide integrated psychiatric and somatic care. And interventions should be created to enable patients to give up those perceived positives of BD that are unavoidably lost by treatment. On the access side, there's something that's also been piloted in Montana that was started in New Mexico called Project ECHO that provides video conferencing of experts, for instance, in psychiatry to general practitioners, physicians assistants, so you can get expertise deployed out to rural areas. That's one way to improve access, get shorter waiting lists, affordable services, good access in rural, uh, for both rural and urban populations and serve the economically disadvantaged. Um, we need policy change to, to deal with the payer system uh, um, where they're incentivized to, to give patients the choices that will lead them to wellness. And so ideally then, we would, we would experience the positives of pharmacotherapy. We would mitigate the loss of the negatives, of, of the loss of that mermaid, of the benefits of bipolar disorder. We would remove the, that alligator of the negatives of bipolar, or at least alleviate it, um, and gain those positive a stable life. And, and with <clears throat> pace, that patients increasingly well, the healthcare system load reduced, we now have more capacity with regard to the, the demand. And we believe there's some extra things with regard to how one can, there's, there's system improvement disciplines from manufacturing, like lean manufacturing, Six Sigma theory constraints that have been applied uh, in healthcare systems to improve how much we can get from the system with existing resources. It's a whole other presentation, but um, we need to figure out better ways to, to utilize what we already have and have providers be able to deliver high quality care in sufficient quantity and then we can take the time to really give proper care and get you know, patients being informed about all the resources, having psychoeducation that's comprehensive, individualized treatment strategies, better diagnosis, um, perhaps because you have a team examining the patient and, and more than one set of eyes, um, delivering psycho, uh, social support, referrals to additional providers, and having uh, needed rehabilitation services. So this is not necessarily a fixing everything, but think, we think this could, we could elevate the whole system by, by both doing research in these areas of improving psychiatry, figuring out how to get better access, 
and then as we have more resources, giving the time and attention that it needs, that, that our, our patients deserve. So we want quality versus quantity as a conflict to be turned into we deliver both quality and in the quantity that's needed to, to make everyone well, or as well as can be done. So on that original conflict, um, we want to get rid of the crutches now and get rid of the alligator and have our mermaid and get rid of and keep the pot of gold. So if we now have most patients' mental health care needs addressed um, by seeking pharmacotherapy, um, then we're going to see uh, uh, less negative experiences and a belief that, you know, pharmacotherapy helps. I mean, if it actually did work, like antibiotics work, we wouldn't be looking for so much uh, alternatives. And so further, if, if the bipolar is really treated and, and addressed and we're seeing the benefits, we're becoming more and more well, um, easier to treat, people still want to feel good, and so they, they uh, believe it's good, they take pharmacotherapy, and we have a virtuous feedback loop of the good treatments are leading to wellness. That's not where we're at today in terms of the mental health system and the treatments available, but we want to at least move in that direction. Now people are still going to want alternatives and, um, and want to have the positives of bipolar disorder. And so we need to find evidence on what alternative treatments work and what don't work and use them either in addition to or as replacements for, for therapies, but have an evidence base that informs that versus individual trial and error. And so if those alternatives are also used, the ones that really work in place of ineffective ones, that's going to benefit leading to the, the removal of symptoms and the better management of care. And then with less oscillation of going on and off treatment, we'll have less treatment resistance as well. So where we're going in the next couple years is we're going to complete a bunch of studies on hospitalization, suicidality, the ones I mentioned before. We're doing more focus groups where we've identified with this whole process some patient-centered outcomes, alternatives are high interest. There's only so much in our database about alternative treatments, but things like psychotherapy is an adjunct is some, pardon me, we can look at. Electroconvulsive therapy is something we can look at. And then we're going to be uh, conducting focus groups on the youth and the elderly to find what are the unique concerns <laughs> there and perform studies uh, answering, you know, finding that evidence for better treatment for, for, the, for, for our children and our elderly. We'd like to do the suicidality study segmented explicitly in children and look at drug comparisons uh, among those. And we're going to disseminate our findings in scientific publications and with NAMI, we really want to be figuring out what are the patient accessible materials. Um, videos, hopefully talks like this are helpful, brochures, lectures, and so we're also asking in our focus groups, well, what are the, the conduits by which we can communicate um, our findings? And so if you're interested, this was just recently published, this whole uh, focus group experience. With that, I'll close and thank you for your attention. Yes? Where could one access this publication? So, if you, the question was asked, where can we access this publication? It's free and online, so if you were to write this title down and Google it, you would find a PDF. It's a Bipolar Disorders Journal. Um, you can find it on PubMed uh, as well. Okay. And we'll put it on our Facebook page. Yeah. Yes? Um, going through the process of uh, Matt and you and, and getting together and, and having a plan and, and, and doing some research and the funding and stuff like that, how, how can you, how can we, how can uh, people like uh, legislatures or, or, or our communities understand that there can be a process uh, to improving
some of the, our problems or uh, some of our needs in, in the community? Uh, or is it just that there's no system to, to bring those uh, answers or solutions in or find solutions, you know, in the community? Uh, you, know, you know, I'm saying, I'm, uh, yeah, how can I'm, it be better? Or, or is it? Or you just, you just do the best you can? I mean, I, I've, I've spent so many years, like I used to run my own company. And, and you know, you saw this model of the, of the, you know, the mermaid and the pot of gold and the crutches and the alligator. Even when I was the boss of it all, the change management was hard, right? Every stakeholder has their own version of each of those four things. And so when we're trying to, you know, change our legislature or even changing ourselves is pretty hard, right? It, it is an uphill battle, and I think there's a certain... We, we think, well, if people just knew better, they would do better. There's also, I think, a, it takes time to reorganize our brains around the idea of new solutions. And it's also very hard, even though <laughs> system thinking is amazing, we can sort of project a whole future. But someone's like, yeah, until concretely I can experience and know that someone else did it and it worked, you know, it's, it's hard to, to make those changes sort of without the evidence of our senses in the here and now. So, you know, we were t talking yesterday, there was, there was some questions about, you know, potential cuts in funding for, for mental health. And, and, and if we were to do a system analysis like this, I think we would see there'd be a delay uh, in, but ultimately an economic detriment to, to the whole state. But the here and now says, well, we're saving some money by having some cuts, yeah. right? And so to be able to think systemically requires us to think beyond the here and now. And, you know, our, our ancestors were pretty much living in the here and now for, you know, up until a few thousand years ago. And, and it's hard uh, for us to, to do that. I'm not sure if I'm fully answering your question, but, yeah, but it's, yeah change management's right, challenging. And, and I'm sorry, but, but we're going to have to cut you off. Grab Christoph in the hallway. He, he's got a bunch of got a bunch of great stuff, and he is absolutely one of the most friendly, engaging researchers that you're ever going to talk to. So grab him and say, "All right, sit down, Christoph. We need to talk about this." So. Thank you.